Bible is full of stories that we all know and love. But how well do we know them? The answer might surprise you. The Bible you thought you knew is going to dive deep into the exquisite details of the biblical stories that make them fascinating and transforming. In this week's podcast, we will take a look at a passage that typically does not attract much attention. It involves the story of the disciples, Jesus' disciples, finding someone to take the place of the disgraced Judas. Of course, it also treats Judas' death. The text I have in mind is Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 26. The story begins when Peter stands up to address the brothers, a generic way to refer to the fledgling group who were following Jesus. That's in verse 15. So far, there were about 120 comprising this group. According to the previous paragraph, presumably some of the members of this beginning, this nascent community, were women. That's in verse 14. Peter starts by noting that Scripture had to be fulfilled in that it had foretold not only Judas' betrayal of Jesus, but also the circumstances of his death. The accuracy of this prophecy is related to the fact that the Holy Spirit spoke through the agency of David, Israel's famous king who was behind so many psalms. That's in verse 16. Here, as elsewhere in the New Testament, the prophetic nature of the Psalms is being emphasized. Peter proceeds to explain to his audience details concerning Judas. Of course, at the beginning, Judas was part of Jesus' inner circle and participated in the disciples' ministry. That's in verse 17. It may be that Peter's audience in this instances, in this instance, was the folk presumed to be readers of the Acts of the Apostles. Otherwise, why would Peter need to relay details already known to the inner circle? In any case, Peter rehearses the events of Judas's demise. He had bought a field with the money he earned in telling authorities where Jesus would be. After this purchase... Somehow Judas managed to do something to himself in this field that resulted in his being eviscerated. That's in verse 18. For that reason, in Jerusalem, this plot of ground became known as Akeldama, or the field of blood. That phrase was to be understood, quote-unquote, in their language, meaning either Aramaic or Hebrew. Of course, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus had committed, Judas had committed suicide by hanging himself. That's in Matthew chapter 27, verse 5. Peter then quotes the scripture that foretold Judas's death, resulting from his betrayal and the reason why a replacement was necessary. The first quote is from Psalm 69 in the Hebrew Bible or Psalm 68 in the Greek version, otherwise known as the Septuagint. In the Hebrew version, it is verse 25 that is being noted, and in the Greek version, verse 26. This psalm predicts, in effect, that the ground that Judas purchased became cursed and unclean because of Judas' Judas's despicable actions. The second quote is from Psalm 109, verse 8 in the Hebrew version and 108, verse 8 in the Greek version. This psalm indicates that it is incumbent, it is incumbent to replace Judas in the inner circle. Peter wants the people to whom he is speaking become aware that what they are about to do was sanctioned by Scripture. At this point, Peter directs attention to the task at hand. He communicates that one of the men who had been with the eleven from the time Jesus first appeared up to his recent ascension now must become one of the witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. 
This means that since John the Baptist began his preaching and baptizing ministry, which was simultaneous with Jesus' first appearance, others besides the twelve apostles had followed Jesus closely. That's in verses 21 and 22 of Acts chapter 1. Subsequent to Peter's making these remarks, two candidates were brought forward. One was named Joseph, otherwise known as Barsabbas, with the surname of Justice. The other candidate was Matthias. One of these two men would eventually replace the disgraced Judas. Judas. Which one would it be? Curiously, no criteria were mentioned for this selection. Presumably, both men had been around for Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. But other than that, nothing else was considered important. Evidently, both candidates were equally qualified. Still, a decision had to be made. Jesus' basic disciple group had to consist of 12 people, no more and no less. Why was that number so important? It is because when Jesus called 12 disciples or apostles to become his inner circle, he was performing a prophetic speech act. A speech act is a prop of sorts. Because Jesus' ministry was basically confined to the lost house of Israel, Jesus chose 12 disciples to correspond to the 12 tribal units of Israel. Jesus would not only preach to Israel and Israelites, referred to as Jews in Jesus' era, he would also symbolize his connection to Israel by calling precisely twelve disciples. Jesus, of course, was a Jew and therefore an Israelite. He saw his primary mission mission as dealing with Israel. That is why twelve disciples was not an arbitrary number. It was a number with great symbolic significance. For that reason, once Judas was gone, without question, he had to be replaced. This need would require prayer, so prayers were offered. In this prayer, it was acknowledged that God knows what is in people's hearts. That intimates that the Lord already knew who the best candidate to take over for Judas would be. Judas failed in his mission. The man who replaced him needed to succeed. That was the gist of this prayer. In effect, the prayer was designed to discern the will of God. But prayer was not the only strategy that this group put into motion. In addition, lots were cast. The only other time in the New Testament that lots were cast was when Roman soldiers were attempting to see which one would be able to claim Jesus' clothes. This scene is repeated in all four Gospels. Matthew, chapter 27, verse 35. Mark, chapter 15, verse 24. Luke, chapter 23, verse 24. In John, chapter 19, verse 24. Of course, no soldier could have predicted the outcome. Casting lots, by definition, involved chance. In the case of the disciples praying to find the right candidate to take Judas's place, the casting of lots was a way of confirming the results of their prayer of discernment. Perhaps there might have been a debate about the results of the prayer, but the casting of the lots would be determinative. And so it was. When the lots were cast, Matthias was chosen. From the time of that time on, he became one of the twelve apostles. What sort of disciple was he? There is no way to know, since he is never mentioned again, either in the book of Acts or in any other place in the New Testament. He began in obscurity. This is the first time we ever hear about Matthias. And he ended up in obscurity, 
This is the last time we ever hear about Matthias. He may have been a superb disciple. He may have been an above-average disciple. He have, may have been an average disciple. He may have been a below-average disciple. He may even have been a terrible disciple. There is no way of knowing. Regardless, henceforth he takes Judas' place as one of Jesus' twelve apostles. However, it is somewhat curious that the narrator does not assert in any way that the disciples' prayer worked just as the prayers hoped. The group prayed to discover God's will, but the lots clinched the choice. Now, all other things being equal, Matthias was probably the best choice. Clearly, that is what the disciples believed. Almost certainly, the author of the book of Acts is making the point that the lots simply confirmed the purpose and the result of the prayer. Matthias was the right choice. At the same time, casting lots involves randomness, chance, statistical probability, and not knowing for certain the outcome. It is the equivalent to throwing dice. It is gambling. Granted, there are times in the Old Testament when people discern something by casting lots or something equivalent. And in those instances, somehow the right choice is made. In ways that pass understanding, providence, and the casting of lots, or an equivalent form, works together. In modern times, though, anyone who suggested combining prayers for discernment and casting of lots would be laughed out of court. Personally, I agree that the casting of lots has no place in deliberations of any sort, not to mention when the church has to make important decisions. But I do think that this biblical instance, instance of combining prayer and casting lots is instructive in another way. I want to make a case that discerning to find God's will requires a large dose of humility. Jesus advocated that we pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That should be always the goal of any Christian prayer, finding and, when possible, implementing God's will. Nevertheless, there are times when God's will is extremely, maddeningly elusive. All I am saying is that we should take texts like this one in Acts as a way of not being profligate in insisting that what we in the church are doing is without question, every time and in every circumstance, God's will. And it's God's will without remainder. In a sense, the best we can do is expend every effort to discern God's will. Afterwards, we need to keep on praying that God's will has been, as a matter of fact, done. When eventually evidence indicates that almost surely God's will has not been done, we need to have the humility to admit to this and then try to remedy the situation. Treating any ecclesiastical decision as automatically reflective of God's will is a formula for disaster. Abraham Lincoln famously said this about the two warring sides in the American Civil War. The president was speaking to the fact that clergy on both the Union and the Confederate side were praying for God to ensure victory. Of course, Lincoln opined, both might be wrong to enlist the deity's help for such an endeavor. But if it was appropriate to enlist God's help for victory, then one side had to be wrong. Let me invite you to go to my website, faspina.com, 
Fine, let me know what your email is. If you'd like me to answer a question in a subsequent Q&A session, email me at fspina106 at gmail.com. I want to thank you so very much for listening to The Bible You Thought You Knew. I have a question for you. Do you have a question or topic that you'd like me to cover on the podcast? If so, all you need to do is head over to Apple Podcasts and do two simple things. One, leave a rating and review telling me what you think of the podcast. Two, in that review, ask anything you want related to the Bible. That's all you have to do. Then, listen in to hear your question answered on a future episode. Join us next time on The Bible You Thought You Knew when we discuss Jesus' personal Bible. God bless.